So our next speaker in the lineup is uh, has been a speaker regular at OSDFCon for many years. Uh, Jamie Levy has been contributing to volatility for a long time uh, and has frequently given talks and workshops um, at OSDFCon on using volatility and its various new feature features. Uh, this year is no different. Please welcome Jamie as she talks about volatility and the importance of memory forensics. Um, and as a reminder, especially for those who are, who are just coming in new, um, we do have, uh, please ask the questions in the Discord uh, channel. And at the end of them, I will go through them and we can uh, ask them of Jamie and she can answer them. So thank you for joining us again, Jamie. Thank you for having me. And I appreciate everybody coming for this talk. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some volatility stuff. Uh, so a little bit about me, just uh, I am a core developer on volatility. I'm also a co-author of the Art of Memory Forensics. And during my day-to-day, uh, -day, I am the director of R&D at Huntress. I've also done a lot of DFIR and dev work at various other places. And you can follow me on uh, Twitter at Glita. So a little bit of background. First of all, how do we know what is normal? Uh, on a system in order to find some malicious code. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, normal DLL loading and what does that look like? And then we're going to look at different injection techniques and then we're going to see what that looks like. And then we're going to use that knowledge to find some other edge cases that don't really fit one of these categories. So when you have normal DLL loading, uh, you have something that looks like this, you have your process, uh, which has these, this pointer to all these uh, different lists that contain information about the DLLs that are loaded. Uh, it's also loaded uh, with page permissions of uh, copy on write or read only. And so this is something that's normal. So obviously malware wants to be able to have code running long-term on the system and kind of blend into the system. And one way that it's able to do that is by using code injection. So there's many different ways of uh, injecting code uh, from a malicious process into a target process's address space, but we're only going to cover three different methods, which are the ones that are normally found uh, out in the wild. If you want to look at uh, other injection methods, there is a nice library called Pinjectra that you can download, and it has over 12 different uh, methods that uh, are available to use on uh, updated Windows 10 machines. So looking at code injection, we're going to uh, look at shell code injection first. So this is where we have a, a malicious process that's going to load a piece of shell code within a target process's address space. It doesn't uh, load the full DLL, it's just basically some assembly language that can be a multi-stage payload that can uh, do various things and download other uh, DLLs and, and resources and execute them. So the way that this looks in memory, it stands out pretty, uh, pretty obvious. Uh, we're able to see that we have page permissions, a page execute read write. Uh, we also, uh, if we're running the Malfine plugin, we can we can get a view of the code if it's uh, if it's uh, valid disassembly. We'll see that pretty obviously uh, down here in the view as well. So sometimes you have a uh, remote library injection. So this is where you have a malicious process that's loading a DLL from disk into another process. And then at that point, the malicious process can exit after it's uh, made the proper calls to, uh, to actually execute the code in the target process. So how you go about finding uh, this remote library injection is by using DLL list within volatility. And it very easily shows up here within the DLL list as well. So one thing that attackers could do in order to hide that DLL is to unlink the DLLs, that particular DLL from the DLL list. And at that point, you'll have to do some kind of comparisons between the virtual address descriptor tree, which is this tree that contains uh, all of the different memory segments for that running process including all DLLs and files and everything that are loaded uh, for that particular process and comparing that to this list of DLLs and seeing if there's any conflict there. And of course, we have a plugin called Loader Modules that automates this for you. 
So the next thing I'm going to talk about is reflective DLL loading. So this is where you have a malicious process that's loading a DLL into a process without it touching disk. All of the major attack frameworks have this capability. Um, and basically, it's, it's very useful because it doesn't touch disk. It doesn't make as many artifacts uh, on a dead box. It's only within memory. And so you actually have to look at memory in that case in order to find that information. So how does that look uh, within memory? Uh, if you're running the Malfine plugin, it very easily stands out. We have this page execute, read, write permissions. And if we look in the view, we have uh, this MZ header that we're very e easily able to see. Now, one thing to note is that attackers can uh, zero out this MZ header. So Power PowerShell Empire, for instance, will delete the uh, MZ part of the header uh, so that it's not real obvious. So like a lot of EDR tools um, may just look at the first two bytes of memory segments and see if there's an MZ there and uh, that would actually stand out. And if that it's not there, then they most likely won't notice that this is actually something that's malicious. The thing is that the, the header itself isn't something that is needed once the DLL is loaded. So once the loader loads that into memory, um, it no longer needs that header information. The header information has things like the size and, and basically how it's supposed to be loaded within memory. Once it's loaded, that's no longer needed. The attacker can go back and wipe the entire header and uh, we wouldn't know that this was something that's malicious. So even if you're looking at the malfind output, this would all just be zeros if it was zeroed out. And it might not be really obvious that this is something that you might want to look at. So in that case, uh, what you want to do is make sure that you dump the entire memory segment and then look at it with strings and, and see whether or not um, there is something else within that memory segment that looks uh, of interest. Most likely you would have some API calls or some references to other DLLs or resources or code that might uh, look interesting. So we talked a little bit about the VAD tree. Um, this is important so that this is important to note uh, in order to figure out how to get the malicious code from the next techniques that we're going to talk about. So again, the VAD tree basically contains all of the different memory segments that are loaded by that process at that moment in time. So all the DLLs, all the different uh, file objects and other memory segments that are within that process's address space are contained within this bad tree. So let's talk about some of the other techniques uh, that might be of interest. So we talked a little bit about stripping MZ headers and how that could manifest and that we have to go back and look within uh, the VAD tree in order to dump, to dump those out. Or if, if we have unlinked DLLs as well, we have to basically look at the VAD tree and see how that plays out. Um, also, we might have uh, a malicious actor who realizes that this read, write, and execute permissions uh, is basically hurting it. It's basically putting a big red flag of here I am, this is my malicious code, dump it out. Uh, so various attackers have figured out that basically if they roll their own loader, that they can have the uh, proper permissions of something that, that doesn't have these uh, read, write, and execute bits and doesn't stand out as something that is malicious. So one of the libraries, uh, one of the older libraries that you can find on GitHub is something called uh, Memory, memory uh, Module. And I think the code is like somewhere from six to 10 years old at this point. Uh, but Scythe, uh, the, this company Scythe has basically gone and forked that code and uh, rewritten it, make it a little more user-friendly and also done some updates to it. And so you can find that on GitHub and uh, play around with that. And we're going to take a look at that particular uh, code and see how that manifests within memory. There's also another example that I wanted to go over, uh, which is uh, some uh, Python, or, I'm sorry, a PowerShell uh, implementation of Print Nightmare. So if you guys remember, Print Nightmare was like the big debacle that happened earlier this year, uh, where the print spooler was basically exploited 
and uh, would allow you to do things like add users to the system, et cetera. And so there is a nice uh, PowerShell implementation, which is written by Caleb Stewart and John Hammond, which are brilliant coworkers of mine uh, at Huntress. And uh, so I decided to take a look at that implementation and see how that uh, plays out with the memory as well. So now uh, I'm gonna do a couple of demos. So the first thing, I, and just to save time, I went ahead and ran this ahead of time because I was having some issues with my virtual machine. Um, so this is the, the code from Scythe. I basically compiled their, uh, their demo executable and DLL, and I've run it two different ways. So one of them, I'm running it with uh, run DLL32, call the DLL, and then I'm calling the function that is actually um, doing the execution. So that function name is uh, do something. And so if I run it like this, it's going to actually do something. All it does is it puts out this message box that says, hello world. And so that way I know that it's actually executing and doing something. Uh, the next way that I'm running it is uh, with their sample executable. And what it's going to do is it's going to take this uh, DLL and it's going to load it with its own uh, lo uh, loader that it's implemented. And once it's uh, loaded, it's going to execute that. And we'll have another hello world that pops out as well. So let's see how this actually uh, manifests with the memory. So I made a little config file for the memory module. I'm going to run PS list just to see what I have available to me. Uh, notice that I have these two different processes. These are the two processes that I created. One of them is the run DLL 32. Uh, I'm just gonna run DLL list uh, against the run DLL 32 process first and see what I have here. And then notice that I, I have this uh, the sample DLL uh, available to me. So this is just a basic, um, this is just like how the DLL was loaded under normal circumstances. I can look at that within uh, the VAD. as well. So if I just run bad info against that particular process and search for that DLL, I will find uh, that this, this is how things normally look when you're looking in the bad when, when DLLs are lo loaded under normal circumstances. So we have the path to the DLL. Uh, we have uh, also this page permission of execute write copy. So these are the things that we're looking at for normal circumstances here. So now, if I go back to my process list, I want to look at this particular process because we know that something is different about this one. So first of all, I'm just going to run DLL list and see if there's anything that stands out over there. And if you notice, I don't have anything that's a sample uh, DLL within this list. There's no DLL there. And if I run that info to see if I can find that DLL, I don't find any information about it here either. Uh, so how can I go about getting that DLL back? So remember, uh, we can dump out all of the different segments for uh, that particular process, we can use this bad dump plugin, and I'm going to dump it into a uh, folder, memory module dumps. The next thing I want to do is I want to, um, I have basically saved this DLL list for, uh, for my basic info. 
Uh, when you're looking at DLLs within the, um, the VAD space, this base is the starting point of that particular VAD space. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at, uh, I'm going to create a suspects list of these particular um, segments that I have dumped out from memory. And I'm going to see if there are segments that are not within, that are P files that are not within this DLL list. So I'm basically gripping out all the different PE files. And this part here is uh, the base offset. So that's the start of that bad segment. So I'm going to look to see if I have information about that uh, particular item. And I don't. So I don't, I don't have that particular base within the uh, DLL list. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run strings against this file and see what it is. And then I see that this is a, a PE file. If I kind of scroll down to the to the end of it, I see that we ha I have all these different API calls for uh, various things. I also have uh, the code and just to speed up since I know what I'm looking for. But if I were to uh, basically look through this, I would I would have all the other information. This is just verifying that this is in fact the, uh, the DLL that I'm looking for and uh, I was able to find it. So this is the hello world that we saw in the prompt earlier and I have this here. Okay, so now I'm going to look at the uh, the nightmare memory sample. So this is my victim. I've run uh, this print nightmare, this uh, PowerShell implementation. I'm just going to uh, run PS list just to get a start and see what I have here. Since PowerShell is still running, uh, I'm in luck and I'm able to see uh, the different items for PowerShell. Now, again, if I were to run a uh, DLL list, I wouldn't see anything. If I were to look at uh, VAD info, I wouldn't uh, see anything uh, interesting over there either. Um, so how would I go about finding this? Again, what I could do is I could dump everything, which I've gone ahead and, and done just to kind of save time. Uh, dump everything into uh, a folder and kind of go about uh, the same methodology of creating a suspects file and then going through that. Now, the, the downside is that the PE file is not at the start of the uh, VAT segment. And so we have to actually try some other method to uh, get to it. So just out of, uh, just to kind of save a little bit of time here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, kind of search for this DLL and see whether or not I can find it. So I, I have, in this case, I have an idea that it might be something like nightmare.dll or I have some kind of thought, some string that I can look for. And just to kind of save on time, since I already know kind of what I'm looking for, I'm gonna go ahead and grep for that and find my suspects. So one thing that you could have done also is you could have uh, grepped for um, for DOS header or anything like that and seeing whether or not any of these kind of match up. So 
So I have three suspect files. I'm going to look through them. And sure enough, I see that in one of them, I have something that looks like a PE file. It has this, this program cannot be run in DOS mode. And then we have like several different strings. If I look for nightmare, uh, I notice that I have this, this PDB path uh, from when it was compiled. If I'm just kind of looking through the rest of this uh, segment, I see that I have the, the invoke nightmare function from the PowerShell itself from whenever it was uh, creating this uh, DLL and invoking this. I see this item that uh, is basically the internal name of the DLL. I see all the different uh, API calls for, for that, et cetera. So, I have a pretty good idea that this is where my uh, where my DLL resides. And if I were to actually go back and look for uh, the power the, the different PowerShell code, I could um, I could actually reconstruct that DLL. And uh, and basically rebuild it to have um, to have something to compare it to. Okay, I think we're starting to run out of time. Yeah, so for instance, we here's this function, uh, get nightmare, and there's these different segments of the base 64 encoded uh, DLL. So I can pull these out and actually rebuild uh, the DLL just for a, a proof that this is the DLL that I'm recovering. I could use something like um, Foremost or, or any type of file carver to pull out the, D, the DLL itself from this first uh, dump that we have here, or I could manually do that as well with the hex editor. Okay, so suppose that um, you don't really know like how to start, or you don't know that you're looking for these uh, particular DLLs, and you just you just want to get to something fast. Uh, so basically. What you can do is you can just kind of try to brute force all of the things. Uh, so we used to do something like this at guidance with disk images where we would mount them and then just run antivirus over them and just hope that something would pop and and kind of have a starting point there. Uh, Andrew wrote uh, a very nice blog post about doing this with uh, memory and uh, basically dumping all of the things and running antivirus on, on it and seeing if anything pops out to you as a starting point. So basically running proc dump, DLL dump, mod dump, all of the, the PE dumping things, but also don't forget to run things like MFT parser, which will dump out the small files from the MFT. And you can also dump out the registry files uh, as well as uh, any type of regular files by using dump files. Um, so those, those kind of things can, have, can harbor very malicious code as well. Um, and then also one thing to note, <clears throat> when you're scanning things with antivirus, make sure that uh, how you're exposing it to the antivirus is read only. So that way um, your antivirus isn't going to delete the, the files of interest that you want to actually be able to investigate later. Uh, so you know if you're using a VM or something, expose it to it as, a, as read only. Uh, that way you don't lose your information. 
Also, another thing that uh, I always recommend in investigations is using bulk extractor. Uh, Andrew also wrote a very nice blog post about this, uh, but we use it all the time in our investigations uh, because a lot of times you have attackers and they're, they're typing commands uh, to the machine, et cetera. All of that stuff is unencrypted within memory. Uh, so you're able to run bulk extractor, uh, reconstruct it uh, with Wireshark, and basically see what the attacker was typing in and, and the various information that they're getting back. Also, I recommend a lot of uh, different open source tools for doing pro post-processing when you, after you've dumped out all the things like, so for things like uh, event logs that you've dumped out, I would recommend using EBT extract, which is uh, written by Willie Ballanthan. Uh, it's a very, very good library uh, for reconstructing event logs. Uh, which are not easy to con reconstruct at all. Uh, they're going to be, you know, scattered across memory when we're when we're using uh, dump files. It's also going to have like these uh, zeroed out segments because things are not things are going to be paged out. The entire event log is not going to be about within memory. Uh, also, I recommend using Python registry, which is another library written by Willie. Um, you're able to uh, put in some extra error checking. Uh, so that it doesn't crash whenever you're looking at the registry files that have been dumped out. Again, there's going to be zeroed out segments that are not uh, going to be valid. Uh, that's just part of, of having large files with the memory. And then, of course, using uh, Yara and some other um, tools as well. So uh, kind of one last thing don't forget to do uh, when you're when you're doing your investigations is to timeline all of the things. I don't know how many times we've had uh, cases where we've timelined things and then there were uh, artifacts that we didn't really even know were, uh, were uh, relevant, uh, basically because of, of something that the tool did to the system. And this is uh, an example that we've talked about many times before. This is from a uh, public memory sample that was uh, released by Jack Crook. Uh, it was an APT-like scenario across uh, four different machines. And uh, basically when you timeline it, you get the story uh, of what happened. So somebody had downloaded this executable. When they downloaded it, they ran it. You see a prefetch file that's created. You see a service that's being created here uh, after, after that uh, file has run. You start to see attacker tools uh, ending up on the, on the system. And the interesting thing is, that this attacker tool, like we didn't, you know, you didn't really know what it was. It's just gs.exe. Uh, but then you notice that within the same second after it's been run, uh, that there is a change to a registry key. And that that registry key is in the security hive, it's policy secrets, and that holds information about um, domain credentials and uh, LSA secrets. And so notice that uh, for some reason, this particular tool um, makes a change to that key whenever it's accessing it. And then also um, you see these DLLs that are being accessed after that. These are used to decrypt those secrets from the registry. And so uh, we're able to see uh, this particular artifact that we didn't even know existed from this tool only because we did a timeline of everything and we were able to figure that out uh, at the end. So hopefully you got something out of uh, this particular talk. Um, I talked a, a little bit about some uh, different attack methods that, that haven't been highlighted as much. And uh, also just kind of like some uh, different advice about how to go about making sure that you don't leave anything unturned. Uh, just dumping all the things, looking at all the things and making sure that there are things that, uh, that you're able to catch even though you wouldn't possibly be looking for them in normal circumstances. And I hope you enjoyed this talk. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Jamie. Uh, thanks, it was always great to see you present uh, as well. One of these days we'll uh, be back in person again, I'm, I'm hoping. Um, so. There's a bunch of comments on here, um, a lot about your book and how wonderful the book is, uh, with, along with the rest of the volatility folks on that. Um, we really have a couple minutes left here, but one question uh, that kind of came up was kind of V2 versus V3 on volatility mm -hmm. and kind of, uh, you know, comments on you're using V2, so we'll say oh. V3 doesn't have all the same functionality, maybe that's why, uh, I don't know, could you, could you talk about kind of the uh, 
the current differences between version oh. two and version three of volatility? Yes. Um, so uh, vol volatility three is, is still a work in progress. I don't think uh, we have all of the plugins uh, completely converted over yet. Uh, but you know, obviously, it's it's easier to use for a lot of people because they don't have to specify profiles. In this case, I use config files just so I wouldn't have to type out a bunch of stuff. But um, but yeah, uh, it's it's still basically I'm I'm really comfortable using volatility too, just because I'm a creature of habit. But uh, you know, it, the volatility three is like much quicker, faster, better written. Um, you know, once everything gets ported over completely, it's going to be, you know, the only thing anybody's going to want to use. <laughs> great, great. There's a Windows 11 question in there. Have the profiles been uh, kind of analyzed and figured out for Windows 11? Or is that kind of a work in progress? I think, yeah, I think that's a work in progress. I think, uh, I think it's been done, but I don't think it's been released. Uh, and I don't know what the timeline would be for that. Great. Well, great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.